Steve, you're going to Malaysia very soon. Um, is it your second home now? <laughs> I was there recently, actually, for Liverpool. I was in Kuala Lumpur, but um, as as anybody who's involved with Liverpool Football Club, you know that they're, they're reaching their, the passion of the fans out in in that area of the world is um, is incredible. So I um, yeah. So whether it's Hong Kong, Thailand, um, Malaysia, I um, I love going out there. So I'm really looking forward to. It. Were you ever aware of the impact that playing for a club like Liverpool or Real Madrid would have globally? No, not then. Even though I knew playing for Liverpool that they were very they were very successful. I don't think we travelled, or we don't have the you know the television or the social media. You know. 20, 30 years ago that, that you have now. So you don't realise how popular, you know, the name Liverpool Football Club was until we travel to those to those parts of the world in the in pre-season. And then you see the people, you know, camping outside your hotel all night and just waiting for an autograph or a photograph or, or whatever the case may be. And they, they were so passionate and so <clears throat> they knew so much information about your football team and about your career. It's actually um, quite overwhelming at times. Do you think it's more intense now because of social media? Yeah, probably, probably. I mean, you've got you'll you'll know better than me. But there's no there's no secrets in it anymore in football. Is that you know keeping trying to keep information quiet whether people are injured or whether people are fit or you know there's everybody knows everything about everybody nowadays. Yeah. So it, it's it's probably it's probably the scrutiny is probably more intense. Would you have enjoyed football as much? I'm. I was in Liverpool over the yeah. weekend and I, I took a cab and someone said, oh, this, that's where Paul McCartney used to go. Yeah. And he used to come up and he'll go with his family to this pub. I can't remember where it was in mm. Liverpool. But you can't do He couldn't do that now because the no, moment he anymore. walks in, yeah. someone will take a picture yeah, on yeah, Instagram yeah. or Snapchat. Yeah, that's the pro I think that's the problem now. That's the problem. And sometimes it's, um, you know, if you do want if you, if you to you know, have a little five minutes with your family and go and have a meal, um, you don't want... I mean, footballers, are quite, I think, and I know in the Liverpool footballers, they're quite respectful, you know. If you ask them for a photograph, they'll they'll be more than happy to pose and have a photograph with you. But all these ones where people take them very sneakily, you know. Sometimes I'll be in a restaurant in a bar and I can I can see somebody, you know, sort of you leaning know, back, ang that. angling the phone towards you and, and taking a picture. And you're like, well, if you want a photograph, you know, just just come and ask me. There's no problem. But I think that that intrusion is. Um, is probably is probably not great. Do you think it's caused players to, to close up a little yeah. bit more, less character yeah. in the game? Yeah. And it's a bad thing. Yeah, I think it's nice the fact that you're engaging with, with fans and that was always been the case. You know, if you're if you're on pre-season tour, for instance, and there's um, a load of fans outside uh, the hotel, you would stop and sign autographs and converse with them. Now, you know, the the, the teams have their own security, have their own bodyguards. And there's no, um, or there seems to be less interaction between the fan and the and the player now. A they seem to, yeah, they seem to be more distant. And I, I don't think the players necessarily uh, want that, want it. But in the Premier League, it's just gotten like that. I think Mo Salah in Egypt, you know, Sadio Mane in Africa, they seem to have more a more of a connection with the, with the fans than they than they do now. And I don't think it's, it's their fault. I just think that. They're so big, and the Premier League teams protect them so so much that there probably is a little tiny bit of a of a disconnect. Well, they've become they were you were professional footballers, but now it's become a celebrity. Yeah, the most followed person on Instagram, or he ranks right up there, would be Cristiano yeah, Ronaldo. Cristiano, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Well, he makes a million a million per post. He <laughs> makes more from Instagram posts than he does from his Juventus. Yeah, salary. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just unbelievable. Well, that, I mean, that is you know absolutely phenomenal. And the fact that he has so many commercial partners, whatever you're supposed to say they, they call nowadays. I think that shows, you know, what, what football's all about. But I think you can choose to um to get involved in that in that area or you I mean I don't do any I don't do social media and so I'm not you know when people say oh I'm on Twitter and did you see this I'm more than happy to you know to say no I haven't seen that and I'm actually not interested in it. Um but that's my choice whether the footballers are the same or whether the footballers have companies doing it for them, which actually doesn't even make sense anyway if you've got somebody else doing your social media for you. Um, so I'm quite happily to I'm quite <laughs> happy to be um, to be ignorant of it all and, and stay out of the way because um, the irony being is you're not out of the way because every time you have a good conversation on TV they're going to clip gonna, it yeah, yeah they're yeah. going to upload and it and then put it on and then someone's still going to call you an idiot on yeah. it or because they don't agree or they feel as you know you're biased towards a particular team or you're negative towards their team so I mean that's just the way that's just the way of the world at the minute.
Take me back to your days. Take me back to your time at Liverpool and what it was like to be a footballer from the area and being with the fans. I mean, well, it was brilliant. I lived in, you know, I still lived in a, a you know, I was playing for Liverpool, playing for England, and still, still living in a terraced house in Walton, five minutes away from Everton's ground and ten minutes away from Liverpool's ground. So it was, um, it was fine. People give respected me. It's not. A, it wasn't a surprise to see. Um, I mean, if you saw, saw Mo Salah walking down the street in Liverpool, you'd be incredibly surprised. But it wasn't a surprise for people to see me. So people were fine. It was like, oh yeah, we, we see him every day walking to the shop, or you know, walking in and around the area, or walking down to you know Waitrose or yeah. something, whatever it might be. Yeah. So it was. Um, it was fine. People were. You know, people wouldn't necessarily. You could easily just knock on my front door if you wanted to, because that's you know that's where I live. But people were always fine. They, they never bothered me. I'd sign autographs and make sure I signed autographs at the, the training grounds or the ground and tried to be respectful for the fans because I knew what it meant. Um, but they were, you know, I was lucky. They were very respectful towards me. And even if I went out in the restaurant or I went out in the bar and had a few drinks or whatever, you know, people, you know, touch wood, people were fine with me. Everton fans, Liverpool fans, you know, because of that, that, that rivalry between them. I didn't, um, I didn't really have any, any bother at all. Nothing. What, what no. about if um, someone... Who came to play for Liverpool who wasn't from the area or maybe even overseas? Yeah. Did you try to help them adapt yeah, because you're the local lad? Absolutely. Um, How? Yes, because you'd, 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 you'd see if they needed any help. You'd see if they wanted to go out. You'd see if you, you, know, you, wanted, to, you wanted to know restaurants for the family. You'd make sure they were all, they were all settled because if they were settled and happy, you know, it, made, it made your job as, as a Liverpool player, as a Liverpool captain, it made your job happier. So you, um, I mean, it's exactly when I went to Spain you know, the, the, the Spanish lads would make sure that I was okay. But you fully acclimatised, didn't you? You yeah, learned yeah, Spanish yeah. and but at, made the the at the time, you know, I, I learned Spanish, but I didn't know Spanish at the time of going into the dressing room. So it was, at times, it's quite a lonely place. You're sitting there, you know, while the, everybody's, you know, talking away, babbling away, and you can't understand a word they're saying. So it's, you know, initially it's, um, it's hard. That's why it's important to, you know, to acclimatise as, as soon as you possibly can because it, it makes everything so much better. What were the training facilities like for Liverpool when you were there compared to now? I'm sure you've probably oh. been to Melwood and seen how it is yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, of course, to... yeah. And I mean, I, I, go to, I go to the academy a lot and the new, the new uh, uh, site at academy where the first team are going to leave Melwood and are, are going to move in next, um, I think next pre-season, next August, J July, August, you know, th those facilities are going to blow everything else out the water. So Melwood in itself is, you know, Bit dated. It is 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 in, but you can imagine when I was there, we used to we used to initially go to Anfield, train, um, change, get on a bus, a coach, and go to Melwood, train, and then get back on the bus and go back to Anfield. And you had to go and, to uh, yeah yeah and and you know get changed at Anfield, and that's where we did all the you know we hung the kit out in the dressing rooms where the players got changed and pumped the balls up and hung the kit up out you know but whereas that's all changed now of course the staff do that. And um, the only time we ever started going directly to Melwood is when um, is when Graeme Souness took over, and he he developed the facilities to have your you know your lunch and everything on site. But we used to go back and forth. We only went to Melwood to physically train, and then we get back on the bus, go to Anfield, get changed, and eat at Anfield. Was that so, common? No, but it was it was Liverpool were winning league after league after league after league in the eighties, and the, so it, it just that was it. You know that was the norm. Then, but it's actually, of course, it, it wasn't the norm. It was ridiculous the fact that you, you trained and got on a bus and then went back and you know you did all this. You may as well have just drove to the one site. But the facilities now, I mean, as you said, Melwood is just a bit landlocked in what they can build on it. So this new super facility in Kirby, which will, um, you know, house from the under sevens, eight, nines, tens, right up to the first team. So there'll be a, a you know a progression that you can see. Um, so the first team site is uh, is nearly up and running and it's going to be. Incredible. How good a trainer were you? I was good at training, yeah. Because I, I, everyone's spoken so highly about your ability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was quite relaxed when I trained, but I was, um, I was always a very good runner. My fitness levels were always good. And um, yeah, I used to enjoy myself in training. I used to try things that wouldn't come off, which sometimes drive people mad. But if you can't try things in training, you know, you're not going to try them in the game. So um, I, understood, I understood how important training was. and I used to really enjoy it. Who was the best trainer? Uh, that you played with, because obviously someone like James Milner, currently yeah. he's lauded for yeah, his yeah, yeah. And ability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know people who are not very good trainers. Yeah, on a Saturday when when you know when they go out onto the pitch, they, they, they're amazing. I know definitely know people like that. But the best trainer, I don't know. 
when I went to Madrid, there were some very, very good trainers. You know, the likes of when, when I, early on in my career at, at Liverpool, when you're playing with John Barnes and the Grobelars and things, they were very professional because they, you know, they knew what it meant. And when I got to Madrid, people like Michel Salgado was a nuisance in training. You know, he'd like <laughs> be dragging your shirt and, and, and kicking you when you, you know, you're like, you're my teammate. I don't want to get injured, but he took it like the train. I understood what the training and the, get, you know, the games were about and I'd never, you know, go full blooded into challenges in case you hurt your, you know, your teammates. Therefore, you know, but Michel Salgado was, um, every training session was like a full blooded match where he'd kick and pull and push. And he never wanted to lose a five-a-side game, so he was incredibly intense. He spoke highly of you. He was in Malaysia with us as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he, he's a great lad. Did you help him with his English? No. The way he, he helped you with no, his Spanish? No, because his English was... Um, he, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure he spent time in Margate when he was younger, unlike when he was in school. So he learned, <laughs> he learned English earlier on. He, so. he was saying in schools in Spain... The person who can speak the best Spanish as a te uh, English as a teacher will be the one who teaches English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though if they're speaking and forgive my impression, you my name. Yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, like yeah. that. Yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. It's not, that's why a lot of Spanish players struggle with English yeah, when they come here. Yeah, uh, but he, he he learned it, and he I presume he um, he still speaks it. I see I see him enough, and he travels enough, and he does a lot of television work. So, um, and I'm sure he helped he, you. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Because he, he, he joined. Real Madrid at the same time I joined so you know we were the sort of the newbies around so he came from from Celta of course so um you have an affinity there as the new signing in it you know in a new dressing room uh back to Liverpool days talked about training what about match day traveling how how uh how are the preparations for that compared to now how did you get say to London if you had to play a Chelsea yeah, if or... we played if we if we if we played in London we would invariably just get on a coach at Anfield and now they say fly, don't they? Yeah, struggle through the traffic, and sometimes it could take, you know, six hours to get, you know, because of the traffic in London once you arrived. It might take you three hours to get down the motorway, but then it'd be three hours to get across from London to, Ch to Chelsea. You'd go the night before, so you could always have your dinner in the hotel, sleep, and then go to the game. Nowadays, they sometimes get the train, which is a lot easier than to Houston, and then whatever whatever means, mode of transport, a bus across to the um, to the stadium or to the hotel. Uh, but or they or they fly a lot now. Sometimes they're, they're in the air for twenty minutes, aren't they? The, 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 the journeys are like that. But there's no expense spared anymore, which um, which and the, there was no expense spared to a certain extent when I played for Liverpool. But now it's um, it's a lot more refined, isn't it? It's private planes now. Yeah. You know, a lot of the times you used to just get on commercial flights with everybody else with all the fans. Um, <laughs> but now it's you know you, they have their own private planes now, so it's. Um, there's no messing around. There's no waiting, for, you know, for your bags. They're just driven right onto the tarmac, right onto the plane, and the first off, you know, the first onto the plane, the, the last onto the plane, the first off the plane, and, and they're gone again to, and that sometimes, you know, that's what I said before about the interaction with with everybody. You know, the players are treated very much on their own, and, and rightly so, um, and they get looked after. Yeah, I think. Uh... Rooney was complaining about what they do in America, where they have to take yes. these long flights, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they're sitting in coach. Yeah, yeah. And w Nigel Rio Coca was out in Malaysia. Yeah. He played there. He was telling us the same thing. You yeah, could be yeah. sit, sat next to Andy and Bob. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that won't happen anymore will it, with the Premier League. So not in the Premier League. Not. In but the Premier did League. you enjoy the train? Uh, not the train. The bus journeys with your teammates. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, back then they were long, but the the coaches were luxurious. You know, you had tables on, there was kitchen, you know, a little kitchen area, there's a toilet. So it wasn't as if you sat, you know, just cramped for six hours. You could walk around on the coach, you could have a game of cards, you could, you know, watch the televisions. It was not necessarily iPads and, you know, things like that. But... Um, you still you know, interact with yeah, that's but then the you, thing. Yeah, but then you speak to your... You speak to um, your teammates, which I think is the most important. You see players now when they get off coaches, everybody seems to have headphones on. The biggest ones the, as well. Yeah, and doesn't want, don't want to speak to anybody. Um, you know, that was never the case with when I was there. You were always talking to people all the time when you came off, whether you're talking about the game or whether you're talking about something else. But there was, it was very rarely this like solitude where you, you put them on and you're just locked into, you know, you're locked into the... Um, the moment it was just not like that when when I played. It's another form of disconnect mm. from the current game to the back in your day. But who was the best at cards at Liverpool? Who was the best at cards? Where do you rank? I was okay actually. I was sensible enough. I was sensible enough. I sensible meaning you didn't bet too much. Yeah, or... I used to like a bet, but um, 
there was we we always had a group of players who who who, um, who played cards, but you could never let it get out of hand. Certainly before or after the game, because it's it weighs on your mind too much. You have to be you know you have to be very sensible. <laughs> but you haven't given me a name of who's the best. At cards. Oh, sure, he's the best. I wouldn't say he was the best. David James was one of the worst. Steve Harkness used to cheat, um, but one of the, I don't think there was a particular best, you know, who used to win all the time. So there wasn't a, a shark, basically? No, no, no. There was a couple of cheats, but uh, no. But we, we found them out quickly. Steve, Steve Harkness and uh, ah, David yeah, James, course. you could just rinse him. Yeah, yeah. Jamo was mad. He was too impulsive. Maybe we'll give you a painting as, yeah, a, yeah, as there, a forfeit. There you, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I hope he doesn't see there this. You go. He, no, I hope he doesn't see it. Yeah, he might kill us both. <laughs> um, what about kits, etc.? Did you have the same kit throughout the season? How many kits did a, did a player actually no, get? No, I, I would have kept... We would have kept our... The same kit, really, I think. The same kit? Yeah. It's not like now where you get two shirts every game and you can swap one. I think three now. Yeah, that was, ne that, that was certainly never the case at Liverpool at Madrid, possibly. But at Liverpool, you, you dare not swap your shirts because Ronnie Moran would go crazy and, you, you know, you, that, that was... A, is it because it's uh, a disrespect or is it because... I don't know. I don't, your shirt. I don't know. I think because... The Liverpool players of the 80s who were incredibly successful, we were replicating what, what they were doing. And, you know, it was just never, it was just never a question of... I don't think it was back in, in, in the, the early 90s that you swap shirts full stop. I think it's a, a, a recent phenomenon where everybody swaps shirts. But it was, I never remember anybody asking me for my shirt or me wanting one of their shirts. It happens in Spain. But it, I never, I never remember happening in England where it was like, you know, should we swap shirts? It was just never. I don't, I don't know. It was, I wouldn't say it was a sign of weakness asking someone for their shirt, but it just never ever happened. Did you? Do you have a shirt which you treasure at home out of interest that you did swap with another player, be no. it in Spain? I've got, or... I've got, I've got shirts of my own that I've kept when I, that I've won in finals. But there was no shirt that I swapped. I never asked anybody for the shirts because I always felt it was, you know, you weakened your position, you know, as if I idolised them. So I would, I would, I'd, I never ever asked for anybody's shirt or anything of theirs. But did they ask you? Yeah, I used to swap. I used to swap shirts with lots of people. But you never asked. But I never asked them. If some, but if someone said to me, "Can I, you know, can you swap shirts?" I'll, I'll gladly say, "Yeah, you can have my shirt if you want. I'll take theirs, of course." But it wasn't a case of I was desperate for their shirt. And again, I've got no, I haven't got any shirts that, that I swap with people that, that mean anything to me. What about the other parts of a, whatever you take on a match day, be it even your underwear or your socks? No, I was never superstitious. I'm never interested. Um, too much like hard work to be superstitious. Um, no, I was just given my kit and I got changed. And there was never ever, you know, did you put your right sock on before your left sock and your right boot? No, I just got, I just got changed. I'll do this like the same set of exercises, but it was never I needed to do it in a particular order. You know, we had many people with lots of superstitions. Grobola used to bounce a ball and try and put this light switch off and on, and we couldn't go before he did it. He was, you couldn't go before he did it? it? Yeah, yeah, it just drive you mad. Drive you mad thinking about all those little little things and people getting in bats before the games. And Kenny Dalglish was notoriously superstitious, wasn't he, wearing the same coat? But um, thankfully, I, I wasn't. That, that, that didn't affect me. You came at this slightly odd time where you still had the veterans, mm. the established veterans who won so much yep. and really took Liverpool to, to where they are now. Yep. And then you had this, this new generation coming through, yourself included. How do you assert yourself in the dressing room? How do you balance the respect versus this will to, to, to be the team, to be um, a footballer? I was lucky because I'd spent many years, well, not many years, but three or four years with, the, with, that, with those veterans and they instilled in me what it meant to be a Liverpool player. And also the fact that you had Ronnie Moran and Roy Evans who'd been at the club for many years before I had and they knew the values of Liverpool. They would never let you become arrogant or big-headed. Uh, it was clamped down on you very, on, on very, very quickly. So when we had new players, they would be quite firm on them. And then you had to, you know, show them how good you were by training well and by playing well. And they respected you. And then you tried to instill whatever values you thought on it. But it was principally led by the managers and, and uh, Roy Evans and, and Ronnie Moran. They were the real leaders because they'd, I mean, this was when, you know, a lot of the veteran players had left. We still, you know, John Barnes was there for a, for a long time with us and Ian Rush. And they were superstars. So, you know, they would instill a lot of the values on, on the team, the Jan Mulbys and things like that. Players who'd won everything. 
and then we're trying to teach the younger kids, you know, what it, what it meant to play for Liverpool. Where's the balance between, because you've mentioned several times it was how it was done in the 80s, yeah, yeah, yeah. versus new methods that were coming out. Yeah, the need to change, yeah, definitely. And to be, you know, a lot of the time I think sometimes Liverpool, we're stuck in the ways a bit and we're late to, you know, transition to modern medicine and, you know, like going to Melwood before yeah. when I mentioned on the coach, that was old fashioned. And Graeme Souness was lambasted a lot for changing diet and things at that time. And people were like, oh, it's, it's complete nonsense, this. And it, of course it doesn't work. But he'd, he'd, he'd worked and, and lived in, in uh, Italy and they were f far ahead with us in sports science and nutrition. So he came and brought some of those things in and was criticised for it. But actually it was the absolute right thing to do. And uh, it made sense what, what he did. And it made sense the fact that you... You ate better food. <laughs> it is amazing. Because yeah. And Martin Wenger came in and he brought yeah. his new ideas and people were like, oh, this is just nonsense, this. But, you know, this thing about um, if we ever had a game at 12 o'clock, you know, people would eat the same food that they always had, even if they had a game at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And people were it was superstitious about what they had. So some people would always have a steak before a game. And then if the game was 12 o'clock, they were eating steak at 8 o'clock in the morning, which you found absolutely Disgusting. crazy. Yeah. yeah. But it was like, this is what I do, this is what I eat. So, you know, to, to become educated in, um, in nutrition and diet and you know, modern medicines now and sports science, it's just normal. And if anything, it's just evolved so much. And to a certain extent, sports science is now taking over. You know, football, you see some of the players wearing all, you know, these, um, all the GPS things. Yeah, on the Mo chest Yeah, monitoring, monitoring absolutely everything. And sometimes it's taken away that, you know, the, your, your feeling or your, the naked eye rather than you just look at the screen and go, right, is, he looks as if he's tired now where, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't speak to each other. But there, I, is, a, there is a, you know, it, it has helped, of course it has. I find this amazing because I've had this similar conversation with Steve McMahon and we did course, it on camera. Yeah. But he was obviously part of that veterans. Yeah. And he wasn't too complimentary about Graham Souness, but you yeah. were the young one coming up yeah. and you seem to be very complimentary. Do you think at times... No, I think Sui knows he made mistakes at times and he knows that he was too um, abrasive, aggressive, you know, challenging the older players. I think he knows that now in hindsight. He knows that he got rid of a lot of them too soon. But he came in and tried to instill his own ideas in, in the team. The veterans, because they'd won things in the past, rebelled against them were like well we don't need to do that we're you know we just won the european cup we've just won the league mm. i don't need to do that i do what you know i've got my own routine and so they clashed whereas i didn't have a routine because i was 17 18 19 20 i needed to be molded into what was the right the right thing to do um so i understand why they clashed and why he got rid of a lot of players and you know graham as a as a character you know met challenges head on so if he if he, if he was finding some of the older players were saying no to him. His idea as being manager and in, you know, in, installing some authority, he'd just say, well, you know, you have to leave. And in the end, he probably got rid of two or three more than we should have let, you know, mm. we should have. And we needed that experience just to mould the team for another year or another two years. And then we all could have grown. But, you know, the more veterans went out the door, he had to bring in some inexperienced players. And we, the balance probably just wasn't right. The other reason I find this fascinating is I look at uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and now at Manchester United, he keeps going on about the old days, the old days, but yeah, yeah. I'm just not sure how far that it can carry a team forward if you're going to Well, it can't now. I, it, your values can, and you know, the, the teachings, if you take some stuff that Sir Alex did and he's trying to do, you know, instill that in his own values, I think if you can steal ideas from different managers that you think work, it def of course you can. And you'll always talk about the DNA at Manchester United like you will have Liverpool because of the um, of the history and the success, so he'll always do that. But he's just—I mean—the main problem is is the the quality of the team. You know, there's only so much you can do if the team are not good enough. Um, what do you miss most about being a footballer in the Premier League? Probably the 90 minutes on a Saturday, you know, or, or, or you know, the 90 minutes midweek, because they're the times when you go out onto the pitch play in front of 50, 60,000 people and make them happy or make them sad. You know, they're the, they're the moments you, you crave. I still go to hundreds of games throughout, throughout the year um, and I'm standing pitch side and, you know, you're talking about football, you're watching it, you're enjoying it. But actually, 
you're not you're not taking the, the taking part is the most important thing, isn't it? You know, the uh, affecting what goes on on the on the on the green bit of grass. That's the that's what you miss. But you know, I, I do the second best thing. I'm I'm there, and I was a, as a as a fan to a certain extent, enjoying enjoying the football. Give me a little bit more about Steve McManaman. What did you do off the pitch to to just disconnect yourself from football? When you went home, were you into TV shows? Were you into movies? What, I, what entertained I, you? Yeah, I I used to um, watch other sports. I used to enjoy my horse racing. I used to sit with my father and, and my mother and my family and um, enjoy speaking to them. Of course, I, I I like I like films. I like you know music. Go to I used to go to watch. Um, you know, a lot of music. Whoever may come to Liverpool, I'd go. I'd go and watch them. So yeah, I um, I switched off quite easily actually. But it seems to me you always needed a social interaction. You you seemed like a very sociable person. Yeah, I'm always individual. walking. I'm all, yeah, I'm always out and about and walking around. I'm always walking around the streets and you know going to the shops or going somewhere or you know going for a coffee. So I'm out and about. So there's no surprise that you, as I said, if you if you bumped into me. You know, no one's interested in bumping into me because they could bump into me every single day. You'd, you'd know where I am or you'd know where I'd be walking. It's not as if it's like some mystical sighting of a footballer. <laughs> you know, I'm, you can easily find me and it's, it's actually quite boring to, to see me around. But yeah, I, yeah, I'm always out and about, definitely. Just not on social media. Yeah. Uh, final question because <laughs> I, I'm getting the signal now. Uh, Liverpool to win the league? We'll wait and see, but they've got a brilliant chance this year and if they do win it, they deserve it. And I bet you wish you could be playing right now and I'm sure they, you could yeah, slot into that ab side. Absolutely, because they, um, they're playing my type of football. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for your time. Cheers, really mate. appreciate Thank it. You All the best. Thank you.